abolishing the insidious 15-year rule on British expats abroad from voting in UK elections. Yes. 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 Order. Questions to the Prime Minister. Mike Amesbury. Yeah. Question number one. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr Speaker. Mr Speaker, this Friday marks 30 years since the bombing of Pam Am Flight 103 over Lockerbie. It was the biggest loss of life from a terrorist atrocity on UK soil. I know that the thoughts of the whole House will be with the families and friends of the 270 people who perished and all those whose lives have been affected. Mr Speaker, may I wish all members and staff a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. And I'm sure, I'm sure that the whole House will want to join me in sending our warmest Christmas wishes to all our armed forces who are stationed overseas. I'm sure that I also speak on behalf of the whole House in sending Christmas wishes to all members of the emergency services and those who will be working over Christmas. Their service and sacrifice is inspirational and we owe them a great debt of gratitude. Mr Speaker, this morning I had meetings with ministerial colleagues and others. In addition to my duties in this House, I shall have further such meetings later today. Mike Amesbury. Yes, uh, Mr Speaker, I'd like to wish everybody here a Merry Christmas, the Prime Minister and all members of the House as well. The, the Prime Minister may recall that during the first Prime Minister's questions of 2018, I asked her to do more to support the victims of the leasehold mis-selling scandal. Yeah. Can I use the last Prime Minister's questions of the year to ask whether she's done anything about it or whether she's <laughs> going to kick it into not. the long grass, as she has done with the meaningful vote? Yeah. Can, I, can I say to the... Can I say to the Honourable Gentleman that we have, in fact, been taking action in relation to leaseholds, because we want to make sure that the leasehold system is fair and transparent to the consumer, so their home truly feels like their own. In July, my right honourable friend, the Housing Secretary, announced that no new government funding scheme will be used to support the unjustified use of leasehold for new houses, uh, and our technical consultation on how to improve the leasehold market uh, for consumers is now closed. We have had responses from almost 1,300 people and organisations. We are analysing the responses, and we will introduce legislation as soon as parliamentary time allows. Alberto Costa. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Mr Speaker, you will know that the issue of British nationals living in the EU and EU nationals living in the UK is a matter of the utmost importance to every member of this House. Yeah. Yeah. Given the comments made by the Prime Minister, her welcome comments when she came back from Salzburg about protecting the rights of EU nationals, at least those resident up until the 29th of March, in the event of no deal, can she confirm to this House that in the event of no deal, and I hope that won't be the case, that she will get a legally binding multilateral agreement with the EU on the issue of citizens' rights ahead of the 29th of March? Well, can I say my honourable friend is absolutely right, of course, and has, and, and has consistently raised and championed the needs and concerns of EU citizens here in the UK. And our withdrawal agreement does guarantee those rights, uh, and that's important not just for individuals but also for businesses. We're clear that in a no-deal scenario, EU citizens resident in the UK by the 29th of March 2019 will be able to stay and will be able to continue to access in-country benefits and services on broadly the same terms as now. That demonstrates our ongoing commitment. We obviously want to uh, work with and are strongly engaging with EU counterparts to urge them to make the same commitment to check the rights of UK nationals who are living in the European Union. We have been clear about the rights of EU nationals here in a no-deal scenario. We want the EU to do the same for UK citizens living in the 27. Jeremy Corbyn. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I join the Prime Minister in remembering the events at Lockerbie 30 years ago. I remember the silence that fell on this entire building when the news came out of what had happened at Lockerbie. 
And for the people of Lockerbie, the trauma lives on. And for the uh, families of the victims, it also lives on. And we should remember them today. And Mr Speaker, can I also take this opportunity to wish you and all members of the House and everyone around our country a very happy Christmas, and particularly to those that have to work over Christmas and, of course, our armed services that will also be on duty over the Christmas period. And all the best for a peaceful and welcome 2019. <laughs> Mr Speaker, well, I've gained acquiescence. <laughs> My Christmas good wishes do extend to everyone over there as well. However, until then, until then, Mr Speaker, I just have to say this. The Prime Minister has plunged this country into a national crisis. She refused Parliament the she refused Parliament the right to vote on her Brexit deal. Yeah. She said that she did that to seek further assurances. She failed. She's now claiming that she is still seeking further assurances, while all the time running down the clock on the alternatives. So can the Prime Minister explain to us when the European Council will meet to approve the changes that they have already ruled out. <laughs> Can I say to the right honourable gentleman, we are indeed still uh, working with the European Union. We have discussions with the European Union to seek those assurances that this House wanted us to seek. Can I just correct the right honourable gentleman on one particular point? He referenced the issue of the meaningful vote. We will have that meaningful vote here in the House. I set out earlier this week. I set out. Well, it's, it's absolutely no. There's absolutely no point in members on the other side of the House shouting out when, because I set out in the statement on Monday when that will, uh, that will take place. But can I, can, I, can I just say to the right honourable gentleman, week after week he has stood here on this issue and talked about what he's against. He never says what he's for. So, so if, he wants, if he wants to fulfil the will of the referendum, to support jobs, to end free movement, to do those trade deals, to avoid no deal, then he needs to vote for this deal. He can talk all he likes about a meaningful vote. All he gives us is a meaningless position. Mr Speaker, we should have had the vote a week ago. The Prime Minister denied Parliament the opportunity to have that vote. And she's still unclear as to when it will actually take place. Yeah. Mr Speaker, there are no meetings of the European Union Council scheduled until the 21st of March. And the EU has been very clear there are no more negotiations, clarifications or meetings. She will be bringing back the same deal she pulled last week. It's an intolerable situation and she's simply playing for time. And on Monday, and on Monday in a response to a question from the honourable member for Belfast North on the backstop, she said, I am seeking further political and legal assurances in relation to those issues which can be achieved in a number of ways. The Prime Minister must clearly set out now how will she achieve these legally binding assurances before the House is due to return on the 7th of January? We will, we will set out what is achieved in our EU discussions uh, when we uh, return in the new year, when we have had those discussions, when we bring those assurances back. But can I just say to the right honourable gentleman, he can get as, as angry as he likes about this issue, but it doesn't hide the fact... It doesn't hide the fact that he has no Brexit plan. And I, you know, I, know, I, know, I know it's Christmas. I know he's looked in his stocking down the chimney under the Christmas tree. He still hasn't found a Brexit plan. He has to accept his responsibility to deliver on Brexit. Order. You're normally, Mr Yassine, a most composed, almost laid-back individual. You're becoming very hot-headed. I'm worried for your own sake. Calm down. Be a good fellow. The Prime Minister. 
the right honourable gentleman has to accept his responsibility for delivering on Brexit. And uh, you know, there are some people. There are some people that say that the leader of the opposition just going through the motions. What we saw this week is he isn't even doing that. Mr. Speaker, it's the Prime Minister who is supposed to be undertaking the negotiations. It's the Prime Minister that's failed to bring an acceptable deal back. And if she doesn't like doing it, then step aside and let somebody else do it. The reality is, the reality is, Mr. Speaker, that she is stalling for... Order! I made it clear that the Prime Minister must not be shouted down. No one should even bother trying to shout down the Leader of the Opposition. It won't work against the Prime Minister, and it won't work against the Right Honourable Gentleman. End of subject. Jeremy Corbyn. Speaker, the reality is that the Prime Minister is stalling for time. There is still no majority for her shoddy deal in this House. It isn't stoical, it's cynical. And as the Honourable Member for East Surrey said, we have displacement activity designed to distract from last week's failed renegotiation. The International Trade Secretary said, and I quote, I think that it is very difficult to support the deal if we don't get changes to the backstop. I'm not even sure if the Cabinet will agree for it to be put to the House of Commons. So can the Prime Minister give us a cast-iron guarantee the vote in this House will not be delayed yet again? to the Right Honourable Gentleman, we have been very clear about the process that we are going through, and we have been very clear about when the vote will be brought back to this House. Now, of course, now of course the details of that debate have to be uh, discussed in the usual channels in the usual way, but the Right Honourable Gentleman uh, uh, made a response when I said he had a responsibility on delivering Brexit. Every member of this House has a responsibility. of the votes cast for members of this House were for members of this House who stood on a manifesto commitment to honour the referendum and deliver on Brexit. And what people will say, what people will say to the right honourable gentleman, if he fails to recognise that he has a duty, as has everybody in this House, to deliver on Brexit, that once again he's just bottled it. Mr Speaker, the Prime Minister didn't answer my question about a cast-iron guarantee. She is the one that has denied Parliament the right to vote on this subject. So please, no lectures to Parliament when it's the Prime Minister that's denying MPs the possibility of a vote on this. We should have had a vote a week ago. We should now be debating practical alternatives. She is behaving in a disgraceful way that is frankly an outrage. Mr Speaker, no deal would be a disaster for our country and no responsible government would ever allow it. Just two weeks ago, the Chancellor said preparations for leaving with no deal could not be done in a matter of months. They would take years to complete. No deal is simply not an option. So why doesn't the Prime Minister stop the pretense and stop wasting £4 billion in a cynical attempt to drive her deeply damaging deal through this House? If the right honourable gentleman doesn't want to see money being spent on no deal, he's got an easy answer. Vote for this deal. Mr Speaker, what the Prime Minister is doing is a criminal waste of money. She is recklessly, she is recklessly running down... Uh, order, order, order. In this House of Commons, where we're supposed to try to treat each other with respect, no one 
under any circumstances is going to be shouted down. So stop the attempted shouting down on both sides, abandon the juvenile finger-wagging which achieves precisely nothing, and let each other be heard. It's called the assertion of democratic principle. Jeremy Corbyn. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The Prime Minister is recklessly running down the clock all in a shameful attempt to make her own bad deal look like the lesser of two evils. With rising crime, 20,000 fewer police on our streets, 100,000 vacancies in our National Health Service and the worst performance for any November on record last month, how can the Prime Minister justify wasting that money on no deal that cannot and will not happen. I say to the right honourable gentleman that uh, while until the deal has a deal has been ratified, it is the responsible position of government and it is, would be the responsible position of any government to put in place contingency arrangements for no deal. But I repeat to him, if he wants to ensure that we leave the European Union with a deal, then he has to put into practice what he's saying and actually vote for a deal. And, and he talks, yet again, yet again, he talks about issues like the, uh, the question of the number of police officers and money going into the police. We put extra money, they've made extra money available to the police this year. We made extra money available to the police, and what did the Labour Party do? They voted against it. The Prime Minister should stop dithering and put it to the vote of the House. Let the House make a decision on it. Her friend, the Honourable Member for Totnes, is right, is she not, when she said that the threat of no deal, and I quote, is an absolute disgrace. Yeah. Yeah. The Prime Minister, Mr Speaker, has thrown away two years on her botched negotiations. Yeah. She's now recklessly wasting £4 billion of public money. Yeah. She's holding Parliament and the country to ransom. She is irresponsibly risking jobs, investment and our industries. There have been no changes, so she must put her deal to the vote. Parliament must take back control. There is no majority in this House for no deal, Mr Speaker. Isn't this just a deeply cynical manoeuvre from a failing and utterly reckless Prime Minister? say to the right honourable gentleman, it's a bit rich him standing here and talking about dithering. Let's see what the Labour Party let's see what the Labour Party did this week. They said they would call a vote of no confidence. Then they said they wouldn't. Then he said he would. Then it wasn't effective. I know it's I know it's Christmas. I know it's Christmas. I know it's Christmas. Order! Members must not shout at the Prime Minister. The order Order. Calm yourselves. Try to get into the Christmas spirit. Or if you can't do that, at least listen to the Prime Minister. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Speaker. They said they'd put down a vote of no confidence. Then they said they wouldn't. Then they said they would. Then they did it, but it wasn't effective. I know it's the Christmas season and the pantomime season, but what do we see from the Labour front bench and the right honourable gentleman? He's going to put a confidence vote. Oh, yes, he is. Oh, no, he is. News for him. I've got some advice for the right honourable gentleman. Look behind you. They're not impressed, and neither is the country. Calm. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, may I? I wish the Prime Minister a well-deserved Chequers chillax over Christmas before the start of the new panto season. But on the basis that there may be £39 billion going spare in the new year, may I give her my priority Christmas list? Justice for the 1950s WASPy women. Genuinely fair funding for hard-pressed schools in West Sussex. Addressing the estimated £2 billion shortfall in children's social care. And for good measure, a vote of absolutely no confidence whatsoever in Her Majesty's opposition. Yeah. 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 Can 
can I, can I thank my honourable friend for his good wishes? In fact, actually, I won't be at Chequers at Christmas, but I will take his good wishes uh, to apply wherever I am at uh, Christmas. Can I just say to, can I say to the honourable gentleman that, as he will know, obviously we are putting more money into social care and uh, more money into uh, into the various issues that he, I know, is concerned about. Uh, but I do, I do agree with him that I think if there is any vote of no confidence in this House, it should be with the Leader of the Opposition. Blackford. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Can I associate myself with the remarks of the Prime Minister on the atrocity of Lockerbie? And can I wish you and everyone a Merry Christmas, a time to be spending it with friends and family. I look forward to spending it on the Isle of Skye. Yeah. Yeah. Mr Speaker... The British Chamber of Commerce, the CBI, the EEF, the Federation of Small Business and the Institute of Directors, they represent hundreds of thousands of businesses and today they have said their members are watching in horror at the actions of this government, watching in horror, Mr Speaker, this Prime Minister and the Conservative Party are not fit for government. With 100 days left on the clock, this government has failed businesses. It has failed members of this House and it has failed citizens right across the UK. Will the Prime Minister move aside and put a vote to the people? Can I say to the right honourable gentleman, um, first of all, actually, I think what is causing concern for businesses is the fact that Parliament has not been able to come to a decision because people... Honourable members on the opposition benches and in his own party pointing across the chamber. They have a responsibility to deliver on Brexit for the British people as well, and it's high time they took that responsibility seriously. A deal that works for the UK, a deal that works for Scotland. That's what we're offering. It's supported by Tech UK, the Federation of Small Businesses, the Scottish Chambers of Commerce, the Scottish Whiskey Association, the Scottish Fishermen's Association, Oil and Gas UK. They're supporting the deal. Why isn't he? Well, if the Prime Minister thinks the deal is worth putting to this House, why did she pull the vote? The SNP will not stand by and watch this Prime Minister wreck our economy and rob our citizens of their rights. Mr Speaker, yesterday, alongside other opposition party leaders, the SNP tabled a motion of no confidence in this shambolic government. When the official opposition fails to step up, the real opposition to this Tory government will step in. The Prime Minister is now running scared and denying to give time to our motion for fear of the result. Prime Minister, are you so frightened of defeat that she will deny the Parliament another vote? to the right honourable gentleman. We have been clear that Parliament will have a vote, a meaningful vote, on the deal. Uh, we have set out when that will be. But he talks about the, the questions of dealing with the uh, Scottish economy. If he's concerned about the Scottish economy, why is it that the Scottish Government has taken measures that mean that people earning £27,000 or more in Scotland will be paying more tax than in the rest of the UK? That, that isn't good for the Scottish economy and it isn't good for the people concerned. The Prime Minister was completely correct to castigate the party opposite for their deeply flawed plan to snatch shares in private companies. So will she join me in also condemning the South African Parliament who are currently taking powers to seize land from their own citizens without compensation and solely based on the colour of their skin? Mr Speaker, this is not only wrong, it is also risking putting another African country from a breadbasket into a basket case. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, can I say to my honourable friend that I recognise the concern that he's expressed about this issue. It was, an, it was an issue, the question of land reform was one which I raised with President Ramaphosa when I visited South Africa in August. We, we recognise the concern there is and the need there is for land reform. But President Ramaphosa has consistently stated 
that violent and illegal land seizures will not be tolerated, and he has also consistently said that the process should be orderly within South African laws and taking into consideration both the social and economic impact. We want to see a process that is fair and a process that, while it recognises the need to deliver on land reform, does that in a way that is fair to all South African citizens. Graham Morris. Thank you. It's, it's only a few short months since the Prime Minister promised us an end to austerity. So why, at a time when demands on council resources in deprived areas like mine are, are increasing and, indeed, health inequalities are widening, does the Prime Minister believe that it's right to cut the public health budget for County Durham by £19 million and right. increase the public health budget in affluent Surrey by £14 million? Oh. Yeah. To the honourable gentleman, obviously there are there are funding arrangements that uh, that apply across in terms of the de- decisions in relation to these sums of money. But there are, there, he talks about dis- disparities that occur. Of course, funding per dwelling for the local authority in Durham is more than it is in other areas. Like it's more than it is in my Maidenhead constituency. So there are proper ways of looking at these issues. There are proper ways of looking at these issues and ensuring, as we are, by putting more money into our local authorities, that the money is there for local local authorities to do the job that they need to do. Kevin Hollin-Rake. Uh, thank, thank you, Mr Speaker. Uh, senior managers at Lloyds and HBOS were convicted of a disgraceful fraud against their own business customers. Now there is compelling evidence of a cover-up at the highest level, including a recent admission of the disgraceful mistreatment of a whistleblower. And this week, the compensation scheme for victims was described by the QC Jonathan Laidlaw as partial to the bank's interests. Does my right hon. Friend agree that the Chief Executive, Antonio Horto Osorio, should now consider his position, and also that the compensation scheme should be replaced by an independent process of arbitration? Can I first of all say to my honourable friend that this is an important issue he's raised, and I know he has consistently campaigned on this, and he's, uh, I understand, raised this yesterday in a debate in Westminster Hall. Uh, the events, as he has said in his question, the events at HBOS Reading at that branch constituted criminal activity, and it's right that those responsible were brought to justice. Now, decisions about whether to launch a financial services conduct investigations are the responsibility of the Financial Conduct Authority as the independent regulator for the sector, and I understand they're currently conducting two investigations into the events at HBOS Reading, including the bank's communications with regulators following the discovery of the misconduct. Obviously, we look forward to the conclusions of these investigations, and I know my honourable friend will continue to champion the needs and the concerns of all those who found themselves uh, recipients and, and victims of what was identified as criminal activity. Man, for almost 400 years, this country, almost uniquely in the world, has been a place of safety and security, and a place where Jewish communities have thrived. 2018, many in the Jewish community are questioning whether this will be the case into the future. And a disturbingly large number of young Jewish people are questioning whether they should remain in this country. Does the Prime Minister agree with me that 2019 has to be a year when we all stand up and be counted to ensure that those young Jewish people believe and stay in this country, wishing to contribute and no longer fearing for their future. Can I say to the honourable gentleman that I absolutely agree with him. Jewish people should be able to feel safe and secure in this country. I don't want, and I I never thought I would see the day when Jewish people living in this country questioned whether they should stay in this country. I think this is a terrible state of affairs that that we have come to. There's no place for racial hatred in our society. It's important that we all take every step to tackle it. I was very pleased to be able to host the reception as part of the recent groundbreaking uh, Sarah Con- Sarah conference organised by the Honourable Member and the APPG on anti-Semitism and the Anti-Semitism Policy Trust, looking at the twin evils of misogyny and anti-Semitism. But, my, but it is absolutely right when the Honourable Gentleman talks about the need for us all, every one of us, to stand up uh, now, but to stand up as we go into the new year and say 2019 will be the year when we stand up and say there is no place for anti-Semitism or racial hatred in our society. Yeah. Mr Speaker, um, 
most members of this House on both sides are likely to spend much of the recess working, as will I know my right honourable friend herself. Given the cost in terms of staffing and security, can my right honourable friend think of any reason at all other than grandstanding for the early recall of Parliament? And will she, with our good wishes, continue her endeavours to seek a solution to what we all know is a very intractable problem? Uh, my honourable friend is absolutely, absolutely right. Um, I think it is important that we're able to conduct the discussions that we are taking, are taking place with the European Union, and we've been clear that we will bring that meaningful vote back to this House. I think in the right we've set out the timing on which that will be done. But I would like to thank my honourable friend for pointing out that members of this House, when they leave this, uh, this Parliament, uh, when we go into recess, don't just go away. They actually go to their constituencies and they work in their constituencies and for their constituents. And uh, that is something that is all too frequently forgotten by many. And I thank him for raising it and reminding us of it. Jonathan Reynolds. Yeah. Mr Speaker, homelessness in the UK is now a national emergency and a national disgrace. Yeah. Yeah. How can it be in a country of our resources, our talents and our wealth that this year 320,000 British people have been classed as being homeless. Don't listen to your ministers, Prime Minister. You only need to go to any British city centre this Christmas to see just how bad this problem has become since 2010. Whatever the government thinks it's doing, it's not enough. So, Prime Minister, please, will you try and do better next year? Can I say to the Honourable Gentleman, first of all, I think in the way he put his question, he's... Uh, confusing or putting together homelessness and rough sleeping. These are different issues, but uh, there are nobody, nobody should have to sleep rough on the streets of this country. That is why we are taking action against it. But he raises the wider issue, the wider issue of homelessness. Why is it that we have this wider issue? It is because governments, year after year, fail to build enough homes in this country. We need to ensure we need to ensure we are building those homes. That's what this government is doing. That's what this government is doing. Last year we saw the number of homes being built at the highest level for any but one of the last 31 years. And if he wants to ensure that there is a variety of housing available to uh, people in this country, it is this government that has ensured that councils can borrow more to build more houses. And what did he and the Labour Party do? They voted against it. Mr Speaker, 12 young people die each week in this country from sudden cardiac arrest and that figure could be reduced significantly by more availability of defibrillators. Would the Prime Minister therefore support my 10 minute rule bill which is being presented to Parliament this afternoon asking for mandatory installation of defibrillators in all schools, yeah. all leisure centres and all public buildings so we can end this needless loss of life? Yeah. My honourable friend is absolutely right to raise this issue and we take it extremely seriously and we're certainly Certainly committed to encouraging all schools to acquire defibrillators as part of their first aid equipment, and the Department for Education has been working with the NHS to make these life-saving devices more affordable. And uh, they've also become easier to use in, in recent times. But I'd also like to pay tribute not only to my honourable friend for raising this issue, but to those many people up and down the country who are campaigning and raising funds to ensure that there are defibrillators in, uh, in not just schools, but actually in other places, such as outside the uh, the. Uh, um, hall in Hollyport in my constituency, which was raised by people in that village, money raised by people in that village. We should commend them for what they're doing and we will continue to work to ensure that defibrillators are available. The, the ONS excess winter mortality figures show that in our country over the past 10 years 313,000 people have died because of the cold. 50,000 died last winter, the highest number of winter casualties since 1976. Yeah. It is a shameful indictment on our ability as a country to protect our most elderly and vulnerable residents. Yeah. So can I ask the Prime Minister to say specifically what she's going to be doing this winter to prevent thousands of people from dying needlessly? Yeah. 
There are, there are many actions that the government is taking in relation to the wider issue that the, the Honourable Gentleman has raised about people uh, saving lives over the winter, action that's being taken in the NHS and elsewhere. Of course, for people to be able to heat their homes and be able to have confidence that they can afford to heat their homes, it's important that we help those who find themselves stuck on tariffs that are not the right tariffs for them, that are higher than they should be. That's why our energy price cap is an important step in this. It will help 11 million households. Uh, on average, £76 a year will be saved, and for some, £130. Gary Streeter. Uh, my right honourable friend will be aware that demand for special educational needs is increasing throughout the country, and resources <laughs> are thinly spread. Will she undertake in 2019 to make it an even higher priority for our government to provide generous support for these very special children? Yeah. Yeah. My minister. I thank my, my right honourable friend. He's absolutely right. The need to ensure that we are providing for children with special education needs is very important. We are already seeing £6 billion this year going towards children with complex special educational needs. That is the highest level on record. And we are also investing £265 million through to 2021 to create new school places and improve the existing facilities for children with special educational needs and those with disabilities. But it is also about the programme we have with our free schools that have opened 34 special schools so far, with a further 55 in the pipeline. That is providing for children with special educational needs, and we will continue to do so. Greasy. Thank you, yeah, Mr yeah. Speaker. Yesterday, within hours of the Prime Minister greenlighting the no-deal preparations, my constituent contacted me to say that he had been sent a redundancy notice by his work directly as a result of the chaos this will cause. Her own figures show that any Brexit deal will leave us poorer, but no deal means a £24 billion hit to our public finances. <laughs> the Chancellor barracks, it's his own figures. <laughs> Maybe. So can the Prime Minister tell my now unemployed constituent what public services she's going to cut or what taxes she's planning to rise to deal with that hole? Or is she just going to leave it to one of her successors to deal with these problems? Can I say to the Honourable Lady, while the Government is making contingency arrangements for no deal, of course what the Government is working for is to get the agreement on the deal that has been negotiated with the European Union, such that we leave with a good deal for the United Kingdom that ensures that jobs are increased in this country as they have been over the last eight years under a Conservative Government. Dr Sarah Wollaston. Will the Prime Minister thank, join me in thanking all NHS, social care and emergency services who will be working over Christmas and the New Year? Imagine how many more of them could be employed if we weren't hemorrhaging billions preparing for a disastrous no deal. Could the Prime Minister end the uncertainty by ruling out no deal? And will she also end the uncertainty, please, by publishing the long-term 10-year plan for the NHS before we break for Christmas. Here, here. Well, can I say to my honourable friend that she and indeed a number of others have raised this question of no deal and not wanting to have no deal. As I've said earlier in answer to questions, there is a simple way to ensure that we don't leave with no deal, and that is to back the deal. And see, Lucas. Here, here. Thank you, Mr. Here, here. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Motor neuron disease is terminal, but under this government, people who are diagnosed with this dreadful disease have to prove that they have a reasonable expectation of death within six months or go through a process of assessment. Will the Prime Minister show some empathy, show some compassion and take action with her new Secretary of State? to end this dreadful state of affairs that she is presiding over. Yeah. Can I say to the, the Honourable Gentleman, he obviously raises an important issue about those who have uh, with uh, motor neuron disease. Uh, I, I will note the point that he makes. I will inquire from the Department of Work and Pensions the, on these issues. Uh, can I say to the, the Honourable Gentleman, what I am saying to him is that I will look into the issue that he has raised and I will respond to him in writing. Yeah. Justine Greening. Thank, thank you, Mr Speaker. Uh, the Prime Minister is sending Parliament off for a two-week break at the very moment we have a Brexit crisis 
and no decisions. And our communities want us here representing them in Parliament. If we're not even back until the 7th of January, how can she possibly say that we're doing our job? And isn't the message of the British people crisis? What crisis? We're in a very simple situation, I'm sure my right honourable friend understands. Uh, Parliament uh, members across this House raised some concerns in relation to, specifically in relation to the Northern Ireland backslop in the withdrawal agreement. We are having further discussions with the European Union uh, on that matter to achieve the assurances, as I've said, political and legal assurances that will assuage those concerns, and then we will bring the vote back to this House. Chris Elmore. The Home Secretary will not answer a rather straightforward question. Yes or no, is it the Prime Minister's intention that her government will still reduce immigration to the tens of thousands? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Dame Caroline Spellman! Oh. Merry Christmas. Mr. Speaker, <laughs> my. Uh, order! Order! A bit of hush for a Midlands dame. Dame Caroline Spellman. My right honourable friend was sent a letter on a cross-party basis from those of us who have manufacturing workers and those who support them, who are deeply concerned about the impact of Brexit on their jobs. Would she agree that, that what, what would be best, the best way to avoid the unnecessary economic damage of leaving with no deal is to leave with a deal and protect those jobs? Yeah. Uh, can I say to my right honourable friend, uh, she's absolutely right. Manufacturing industry has been clear with us that they want uh, the country to leave the European Union with a deal, with a deal that helps to protect those jobs. That's exactly what we want to do, and that is the decision that this Parliament will be faced with when we can bring the meaningful vote back. Lillian Greenwood. Mr. Yeah, Speaker, yeah, yeah. almost 1,000 Nottingham South residents have already responded to my Brexit survey. Only 7% back her deal, and more than three quarters want to vote on Brexit if MPs can't agree. Here, here. She won't let Parliament have a vote, <laughs> and she opposes letting the people have a vote. Aren't her attempts to dodge and delay simply costly and reckless? Yeah. The Honourable Lady is wrong. She says that I won't let Parliament have a vote. Parliament will have a vote when we have conducted those further discussions with the EU. Anna Subri. Mr Speaker, I'm afraid that the Prime Minister is wrong when she says that the choice that will eventually face this House is the choice between her deal and no deal. I gently say that no responsible Conservative Prime Minister, we are after all the party of business, would be so reckless as to take us out of the European Union without a deal. Will the Prime Minister now commit to this? Some junior minister presumes to try to shout down the Right Honourable Lady. Not only unethical, Mr Opperman, but always, everywhere, without exception, doomed to fail. Anna Subri. Yeah. It is a little dangerous as well, if I may say. <laughs> <laughs> Would the Prime Minister now commit to this? When her deal fails, as we all know it will, yes. will she then commit to allowing this House to consider all the various options that exist to her deal by way of proper, meaningful votes as a matter of urgency, given the clock is ticking now? Yes. My right honourable friend. The House will be having the meaningful vote that the House asked for. Uh, that meaningful vote will be on the deal that has been agreed and negotiated with the European Union, subject to, obviously, the further work that is being undertaken in relation to the assurances. Uh, but what I also say to my right honourable friend, and, and I recognise her concern that she and others have raised about no deal, I come back to the point that the only way to ensure we don't leave with no deal is to ensure that we leave with a deal. Mary Glyndon. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Will the Prime Minister quickly intervene to overcome difficulties at the Home Office which are obstructing my constituent, Laura Smith, from accessing her vital medication, Dunobinol, and which may mean she will have to face unaffordable procurement costs plus hundreds for the drug itself? Yeah. I say to the Honourable Lady, the Home Secretary is obviously on the bench and has heard the question. I will ask him to respond to her. Philip Davis. The 
uh, the Prime Minister originally said that if we left the EU without a deal, we wouldn't pay them any money. She's more recently said that if we leave without a deal, we would have to pay them some money. The Prime Minister must have taken some legal advice on this issue, as no British Prime Minister would commit billions of pounds of British taxpayers' money without finding out what our strict legal financial liability is. So, given, uh, given that, can she set out exactly what that legal advice is on how much money we would have to give the EU if we left without a deal? upon which sections of the EU treaties those financial liabilities stem from and how much she would give over to the EU if we were to leave without a deal. Is it? That is information that this House needs to know and the EU needs to know. I'm a generous man, Mr Speaker. I'm, I'm a generous... Order! Order! I'm not having the Honourable Gentleman shouted down. The Honourable Gentleman will complete his question. Mr Philip Davis. I'm a, I'm a reasonable and generous man, Mr Speaker, so if the Prime Minister doesn't doesn't have that information to hand, then perhaps she would write to me after this session with the answers to those specific questions. Uh, can I say to my honourable friend that I don't have the answers to all of those questions straight to hand, and I will indeed write to him. Yeah. Speaker Grant. Yeah. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Immigration from the European Union has significantly benefited my constituency economically, socially and culturally, yeah. as it has benefited all 650 constituencies in these four nations. The government's own analysis shows that cutting immigration from the European Union hurts our economy, and that's precisely what the immigration white paper about to be published aims to do. Can the Prime Minister identify a single tangible benefit that my constituents will notice that could possibly compensate for lower earnings, lower standards of living and desperate staff shortages in our public services? Yeah. Yeah. Can I suggest to the Honourable Gentleman that he looks actually at previous research that has been done by the Migration Advisory Committee, which shows that the, uh, in certain economic circumstances and uh, the numbers of people coming to the United Kingdom from the European Union and overall migration into, into the United Kingdom did have an effect on people here already resident in the United Kingdom and their ability to get into the jobs market. Paul Scully! You helpfully circulated a, uh, an update on the behaviour in this place. Now, in the, in the, this year, when we've been celebrating 100 years of women getting the vote, do you think it's appropriate language, can I ask my right honourable friend, to call people a stupid women in this chamber? I say to my honourable friend that I think that everybody in this House, particularly in this 100th year anniversary of women getting the vote, should be aiming to encourage women to come into this chamber and to stand in this chamber and should, and should therefore use appropriate language in this chamber when they are referring to female members. Mr Nigel Dodds. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, can I join with other in wishing everybody a very happy Christmas and a peaceful uh, New Year? And as the, uh, as the Prime Minister uh, ponders over Christmas what might be done to get her withdrawal agreement uh, through this House, can I urge her to consider the necessary changes, changes that need to be made, not just assurances, in order to get somewhere with any realistic prospect of actually uh, winning that vote. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, hope, I hope the right honourable gentleman will forgive me if I say I will like to give him the reassurance that we will, of course, look at all the options that are available for dealing with the issues that have been raised. Order. No, no, points more to come after statements, as the right honourable gentleman is well aware. Thank you.
calm down. I don't need any advice from the. I don't need any advice from the honourable lady. Order, order. I understand that the point of order flows from the exchanges, and in those circumstances, as I've done on previous occasions, I will take the point of order from the. Order. No, 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 no. I'm taking the point of order from the right honourable gentleman. I will be the judge of these matters. Point of order, Sir Patrick McLaughlin. Yeah. Mr. Speaker, you may not have seen during the exchanges in Prime Minister's questions that when the Leader of the Opposition sat down, he muttered words which were quite clearly visible, accusing the Prime Minister of being a stupid woman. Bearing, bearing, bearing in mind, Mr Speaker, the booklet that you issued this week, the words that the Leader of the Opposition said last September, would it not be appropriate for him to come back in the chamber and apologise? I'm pleased to respond to the right honourable gentleman's point of order. As he rightly surmised at the start of it, I saw no such thing. I am not making an allegation and I am not denying or seeking to refute that of the right honourable gentleman. I cannot be expected to pronounce upon that which I did not see and which was not witnessed by my advisers and which I did not hear and which was not witnessed no. by my advisers. What order? I don't need any advice in how to respond to a point of order from the right honourable gentleman, which is what I am doing. What I say in response, with all courtesy to the right honourable gentleman, who is perfectly entitled to have raised that point of order is that it is in order it is incumbent upon all members of this house to operate in accordance with its best conventions and to follow the conventions and courtesies if a member has failed to do so that member has a responsibility to apologize he is quite right to say that what he cannot and i'm sure does not expect me to do is to pronounce a verdict in a circumstance which I did not witness either in terms of seeing anything or of hearing anything, and neither did my advisers. And I will leave it there. And, and it's perfectly order. Order. It is perfectly proper that the Right Honourable Gentleman raise the matter. I have responded to it, and there can be no further to that point of order, because I have order. There can be no further to that point of order on that matter, on that matter, for the simple reason, as he acknowledges with his nod of assent, that he's raised it with me and I have responded to it. Uh, is it on an unrelated matter? No, no, I've already. No, no, I've already. All right. No, no. No, I'm not going to take lectures from members. I will order. I will take. It is normal convention in this place that when a matter has been addressed, again, part of the conventions and courtesies of this House, that people recognise that you don't have repeat points of order on exactly the. Order! On exactly. On exactly. You don't have. You don't have repeat. You don't have repeat points of order on exactly this order on it on exactly every week we do on exactly the same matter order I order I am perfectly prepared to take a point of order on the matter from the leader of the house. We have order. We have we have heavy business today some of which is government statements and with which we will, in due course, preferably reasonably soon, need to proceed. But I will happily take the Right Honourable Lady's point of order. Thank you, Mr Speaker. I would just like to ask, um, after your um, finding there, that individuals who are found to have made unwelcome remarks should apologise. Why it is that when an opposition member found that you had called me a stupid woman, you did not apologise in this chamber? No, 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 no. Yes, exactly. no, no. I'll deal with the point. I dealt 
with that matter months ago in remarks that I made to the House of Commons, to which the Right Honourable Lady in our various meetings since has made no reference and which requires from the Chair today no elaboration whatsoever. She's asked the question. I dealt with it months ago. I've reiterated the rationale for the way in which I responded. The matter has been treated of and I am leaving it there. And if there are a, a point of order, Anna Subri. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. With great respect to the chair, I have to say this: if it was one of my male colleagues on this side of the house yes, yes. that had used that expression against a woman on the front bench uh, on the opposition, then you, sir, would take action immediately. Yeah. This is not you deal with it, as you often do, Mr Speaker, in a fair way, but also from the point of view of women in this House who are fed up over decades of being abused by men? I'm very happy. I'm very, yes, I'm very happy to deal with it. The Right Honourable Lady is absolutely right to say that if I witnessed an instance of the kind that has just been alleged, I would deprecate it unreservedly. It's no good people shaking their heads. I received assent to the proposition, which I think would command widespread assent, simply and logically, that I cannot be expected to deprecate the behaviour of an individual which I did not witness. In order, if the, if the Right Honourable Lady, if the Right Honourable Lady, if the Right Honourable Lady, if the Right Honourable Lady is asking me whether I deprecate without reservation the use of such language, yes, obviously, absolutely I do, without any hesitation. But I cannot be expected to pronounce judgment in a particular case on a given individual when I wasn't privy to the circumstances. But if she's asking me, is that language unacceptable? It is. No, she's... Very well. When do you want to if I and other colleagues, who I can see the phones, clearly the evidence exists. If we bring it to you within the next, what, two minutes, would you then, Mr Speaker, take action? Because, again, I make the point, if it was a male on this side, I think you would against a woman on the other side. The, 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 answer, the, answer, is that, the answer is that it, it, forgive me, but it is incumbent upon a member who has erred, who has used inappropriate language and behaved improperly, to come to the House, order to come to the House. It is incumbent upon that person, or it is incumbent upon that person to recognise the misconduct and to apologise for it. If mem order, if members order, if members produce what they regard as evidence, of course it is reorder. If members produce what they regard as evidence, it is order. If members produce what they... Or I'm in the middle of... Res no, what I say to the honourable gentleman, the member for Braintree, is please have the courtesy to allow me to respond to the right honourable lady's point of order. If evidence is produced, it will be considered, and I will take professional advice, as fair-minded people would expect me to do. Uh, no, uh, point of order. Point of order, Vicky Ford. Mr Speaker... Could you confirm that it is not acceptable parliamentary language to call a woman a stupid woman in this House? And as regards the point of order from the Leader of the House, may I add the words, me too? Uh, the answer is, I have already made the response to that point perfectly clear. So, there is, forgive me. I, treat the Honourable Lady with courtesy and respect, and she's perfectly entitled to raise a point of order. But of that point, of that point, I have already treated. I have already treated. Point of order, James Cleverley. In the leaflet that you distributed, you make the point, very rightly, that we are all honourable members. Our word is therefore evidence. I saw it, sir. I saw him say it. Yeah. 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 All I, order, order, I'm not... Order, I order. I am not seeking to refute what the honourable gentleman is saying. I am order. 
I am simply saying I didn't witness it. The clerk of the House and the other clerks at the table didn't witness it. And I order, and I cannot be, I'm sorry, I cannot be expected. I cannot be expected immediately order. It's no good somebody waving something at me. I cannot be expected immediately to pronounce guilt or innocence. No, no, I can't be expected immediately to pronounce. I can't be expected. What I, what I, what I reiterate, what I reiterate to the honourable, what I reiterate, what I reiterate to the. Order, I'll deal with it in a moment. What I reiterate to the honourable gentleman is that members are responsible for their own conduct and should apologise if they have committed a misdemeanor. It's no good a member standing by the chair and trying to show me something. I would say, I would say, I would say, I would say, I would say what I say. What I say to the honourable gentleman is that order. What I say to the honourable gentleman is that the leader of the opposition will have heard of the allegations that have been made, and if, yes, and if the and if the he will have heard the allegations and order and. Order and if the order, if the right honourable gentleman, in the light of those, chose to come to the House and to respond, I'm sure that would be appreciated by the House. I'm sure it would be appreciated by the House. Point of order, Dame Margaret Beckett. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I understand the observations made by the right honourable lady opposite, and I hope I vow to no one in my wish to see the courtesies of this House observed. But do you believe that it is in order for what appears to be becoming almost an orchestrated riot to take place? (laughs) Order! 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 No, I'm sorry. Honourable and right... Order. Honourable and right honourable members have raised points of order and they have been heard and they have been answered. The notion that the right honourable lady stands to raise a point of order and is then shouted down is order. Don't know to me. That is exactly what an attempt was being made to achieve, and it's not going to work. Point of order, Dame Margaret Beckett. Certainly, Mr. Speaker, it does seem to me, and I have been in this House for some many years, that an attempt is presently being made to shout you down. There is much serious business before this House, and I would be astonished if a single one of our constituents does not view these scenes with utter contempt. Well, I I thank the right honourable lady for what she has said. Yes, of course, I'll come to the uh, I'll come to the other members. Um, Point of order, uh, Dr. Caroline Johnson. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It's clear that this has raised um, some significant upset on, 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 certainly on our side, and I suspect in some of the women and us. I said the, the issue of um, uh, the leader of the opposition being alleged to have called someone a stupid woman, Prime Minister, our Prime Minister of our country, a stupid woman, has clearly caused high feeling. It's also clear that many honourable and right honourable members have evidence to show you, and I'm really grateful that you're willing to look at that and then to take the advice that you need before coming back to the House. Can I ask within what, within what time frame you expect to be able to do so? Uh, yes, uh, that's very order. Order, that's a very reasonable point of order. And the answer is, I reiterate, that I am happy to look at that evidence, if that evidence exists. Uh, order, I don't need the honourable gentleman to chant. I don't need the intervention of the honourable gentleman, which doesn't advance matters. What I say to the honourable lady with courtesy is that I've heard a point of order, I am willing to consider that evidence, and I would come back on the matter as advised by the clerk after the two statements to the House. That seems perfectly reasonable. We have two statements to follow. We have two statements to follow. If the evidence exists, it can be looked at, and a response can be provided, and we can take the matter from there, but it can perfectly reasonably wait and should sensibly do so until the two statements have been delivered to the House and questioning has taken place on them. A point of order, uh, Sir Oliver Hill. 
Uh, Mr. Speaker, I'm, I'm grateful to you for looking at the evidence. Uh, I think they call it VAR in football. Yes. But um, when you come back, would it be possible for the House authorities to have contacted the office of the Leader of the Opposition to make sure that he's present to hear your ruling? Uh, let's wait to see. If I have a ruling, it would be a great courtesy if the Leader of the Opposition were here, and I very much hope that he will be. And I note what the uh, right honourable gentleman has said. Uh, point of order, sir. Uh, uh, well, yeah, the point of order, Dr. Selecrisi. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Calling anybody a stupid woman is not acceptable. 